Jesus is still building his church. Yes, he is. I'm telling you, the coronavirus can't stop Jesus' church. There's not anything that can stop Jesus' church. But, you know, 2020 was quite a year, a lot of battles and struggles. But God has shown us his faithfulness and his grace working in and through us, building his church. Here we are in the middle of summer. And in case you don't know, that is historically a low time for churches. We're right here in the middle of summer, and we're growing. And not going down, not struggling, but we're growing. And I tell you, that is just God moving and working in His people. God is doing something, and I believe that we as a church are just at the beginning of a season of great harvest that many, many souls are going to come into the kingdom, that there's going to be many, many changed lives. And how exciting it is to be a part of the, of the body of Christ, of Jesus' church in the earth today. So I want to cast vision today. I believe that we need to have fresh vision be on the same page as a church and what we're doing and where we're going. And Proverbs 29 and 18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Vision for the believer is that we understand the purpose and the plan of God in our life, that we are moving forward with what God wants to do in our life. He said, where there's no vision, the people perish. You know, you see that of the children of Israel that generation that died in the wilderness. They just went round and round in the wilderness, another lap around Mount Sinai until they all died in the wilderness. No, we got to have vision to go in and to do and to accomplish all that God has for us as a church. But vision gives you direction. Vision will help you to keep going through the battles and through the hard times. And we all have hard times. We all have battles. And we as the church have battles and struggles. But here's the thing. You see, if we really have vision, we'll just keep pressing on. We'll just keep pressing on. Without vision, you get tired and you just want to give up. But vision will keep you going when it gets tough. Now, if you say you have vision, but you don't do anything... That's not vision. That's just an idea. Because vision will cause you to want to do something. It will cause you to want to take action. It will cause you to want to accomplish that vision, to go after it. Vision generates action. And I believe the Lord gives us vision to move us forward in the plan and purpose of God. And it'll cause us to work. It'll cause us to sacrifice to reach that vision. In the New King James Version, and in most of the modern translations, Proverbs 20, 29, 18 goes something like this. Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. You see, vision is a revelation of the purpose of of God in our life. And he says they cast off restraint. In other words, it doesn't really matter what you do. I mean, if there's no vision in your life, then it doesn't, nothing really matters. If you don't have real purpose in life, <laughs> then nothing matters. And so they end up not doing anything, end up not really going anywhere, not accomplishing anything. And I'm telling you that God wants us to have vision. Jesus has vision. He said very plainly in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not be able to stop it. I'm going to build my church. He is still fulfilling that vision and he will accomplish it. How exciting it is to be a part of the church that Jesus is building, a people that he is bringing together for himself to worship him for all eternity. We're a part of that. In fact, he tells us very plainly that 
as his body, as his believers, we have a, a very vital, important part of what he's doing. Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Our vision as a church is to fulfill that commission. Our vision is taken directly from that Commit that, that commission that Jesus gives us. That's our focus. So listen, our vision is to make disciples through personal relationships and strong children and youth ministries. That's our focus. Now there's all kinds of things that are vital and important to us. Lots of ministries that we support. I got to tell you, as, as a pastor, that one of the things I'm so passionate about is worship. I love worship. And I think it's so important. I think that's part of what God is preparing us for in heaven. But here is the focus of our vision, that we want to accomplish what Jesus said, to go and make disciples. And we're doing that through personal relationships, strong children, and youth ministries. I want you to know I see that happening. I see that visioning, that vision being put into action. So many lives are being changed through relationships. I mean, like never before. I see so many people connecting with other believers and getting stronger, praying for one another, working through life together, overcoming together. You know, a lot of our uh, young mothers get together with their kids all the time. I see our men's uh, book study turned into a prayer meeting and these guys come together and people getting free from all kinds of things, getting victory in their home. And I'm telling you, God is using those relationships. It's not, a, it's not just like a, a worldly friendship. No, it's a supernatural thing when the people of God connect with one another and, and we grow and people are discipled. Our children's ministry. We, we had more kids go to camp this year than this church has ever had go to kids camp. Amen. That's exciting. I tell you, God is changing lives. And what a great testimony and witness of the vision of this church to see so many children and young people being baptized. To see them declaring to the world that they want to serve Jesus with their whole heart. How powerful is that? Our youth ministry impacting so many lives, lives being changed. There's not a better youth group anywhere than ours. And I'm just telling you, God is moving and working in these areas. Change lives. But we're not done. We're just getting started. The Lord's not done with us. Amen. He has a plan and a purpose, and He wants to keep us moving forward. I like what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 3, 12 through 14. I got faith this morning, but I sure would like to have my glasses. <laughs> what? In my office. <laughs> Thank you, darling. Isn't she pretty? Wow. She turns, oh, I better not tell you, it's, it's her birthday this week. Hey, y'all works. I like this part of the year. See, for the next five months, we're the same age. So I like that. But that was fast. I'll take anything. What? Yeah, now I don't have an excuse for misquoting the scripture, but thank you, darling. <laughs> Oh, my helpmate, I thank God for her every day. Philippians 3, 12 through 14, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not, take, or I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and, uh, and reaching forward to the things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Notice this. He says, I hadn't arrived yet. 
And we all know that personally. And we need to acknowledge that as a church also. We hadn't arrived yet. We're not done. We're still moving forward. We want to take hold of that as individuals, but also as a church. That for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of us. See, he has a plan and a purpose for his church, for his people. And then he goes on and he says, this one thing I do, forgetting about the past and reaching forward to the things which are before. And I want to tell you, I know some of you have had a a lot of battles and struggles and heartache and pain in the past, but it's time for you to turn that over to God and move on with what God wants to do in your life now. And in the church, I've seen a lot of battles and struggles and setbacks, but it's time for us to put that behind and reach forward to the things that God wants to do this year. You see, God is moving and working, but if we get caught looking back behind, we'll miss what God is doing now. And so we want to focus on what God is doing. He says, I press toward the goal. We just keep on reaching forward towards that goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Our vision is to make disciples through personal relationships and strong children and youth ministries, and we got to stay focused on that. Forget about the things that are behind and reach forward. I want to remind you that it's always about people. That's what matters to God. It's always about reaching people. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to reach people. And that's what He wants His body, His people, to be doing now in the earth today. There's so many that need Jesus. Our, we look at our world, it's in such turmoil. There's so much division, so much anger, so much hatred, so much heartache, so much pain. All this is going on in our world. We look at our world, there's so much that's wrong. Habakkuk saw something similar in his day. It's recorded, recorded in Habakkuk chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. This is what he saw. He said, the burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw, O Lord, how long shall I cry? Are you, are you, will, or you will not hear? Even cry out to you violence, and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore, the law is powerless and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, perverse judgment proceeds. You see, we look at all the wrong that's in our world. People calling wrong, right, and right, wrong. We see greedy adulterers taking advantage of people. We see all kinds of injustices, so much immorality, so much conflict, all this going on in our world. And sometimes we wonder, like Habakkuk, Lord, don't you see, don't you know what's going on? But God has an answer. He always has an answer. The Lord heard Habakkuk's complaint, and he hears ours, he hears our conversations, he hears our prayers. And the Lord answers him in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. The Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. Here's the answer. We need to have vision so that he can run who reads it. We need to make it plain. We need to know what the vision is and where we're going and what it is that we're trying to accomplish. So that's what I believe God is doing today, is He's making that vision clear, and we need to run with it. Remember, if it it doesn't call call you to action, if it doesn't motivate you, then you didn't really get vision, you just got an idea. He He says, for the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak. It will not lie, though it tarries. Wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. I'll tell you, I have had a vision for a long, long time to see this church with every chair filled. I've had a vision for a long time that when we have prayer at the end of the service, that people will just flood this area. 
that it'll fill it up. I'm telling you, we need to have that vision. We need to be expecting and seeing with eyes of faith, not looking at the things which are seen, but the things which are unseen. You see, we're seeing with eyes of faith what God wants to do in this place, that many, many, many lives are going to be changed, never be the same. Oh, we need to have that vision every day. It's not a new vision, but I'll tell you, we need to cast this vision again. This is what the Lord wants us to do. He wants us to make disciples changed lives. See, that's why we're here. We're not here to hold the fort. We're not here to do maintenance ministry. We're not here to satisfy the saints. Listen, that's a, that's, a, that's a dying church. That's what that is. No, we are here to reach people, to make disciples. That's why we're here. That's what we're about. We want to see lives turned around and marriages restored and people set free from addictions. We want to see people healed in their bodies. Amen. We want to see people get free from depression and fears and all kinds of oppression Whatever it is, I tell you, we want to see people who are empty and searching and thirsty. We want to see them find that living water. We want to see people come to the Lord Jesus and serve Him with a whole heart. We don't want to just get them to pray a prayer, but we want to see them following Jesus, living for God, serving God. We want to see their families blessed and restored. We want to see them live in that abundant life that Jesus came to give us. Our Lord said, make disciples. Preach this gospel. Be witnesses of Him. He said that He would build His church. That's His plan. And here's something we need to see. Habakkuk saw the way things were in his day. And we need to see how it is in our day. The Western world is the only part of the world where we are losing ground. That every year there's a smaller percentage who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that's not the plan of God. That's not the vision. That's not what God wants. And I believe that we as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ are a part of the answer that we are part of that vision to see His church built. And we need, to, we need to take it on. I'm just telling you, we need to get excited about it. That if God is moving and working, if He is helping us, see, we plant and we water and God gives the increase. And I believe that we are in a, a season of harvest right now. There's a great harvest. Sometimes we got to change our outlook and the way we see things. We need to adjust our vision. You know, sometimes you you go to the doctor because you can't see well and you get vision correction. And I believe God wants to give some of us a little vision correction this morning. That happened to Peter in Acts chapter 10. Uh, I want to read this story. We're just going to read verses 9 through 16, but there's a a man, a Gentile man, who's been praying. He's been praying to God. And the Lord gives Peter a vision. Well, let's read it. He says in verse 9, The next day as they went on their journey and they drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And saw heaven open in an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners descending to him and let down to earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. The next thing that happens is that 
men from Cornelius' house, that Gentile, come to where Peter was, and Peter goes with them to preach the gospel to Gentiles. Now, to us, it doesn't seem like any big deal, and we know the end of the story. But in that culture, it was a radical change for Peter. He thought that this salvation was just for the Jews. He didn't, he didn't want to go and, and share the gospel with Gentiles. He didn't even want to be around those people. There was this wall between the Jew and the Gentile. And so God gives him this vision three times. Not once, three times. I might preach the same message, three times. <laughs> three times he gives him this message, this vision, because he wants to prepare his heart for the change that's coming. And we need to understand sometimes in order to do what God wants us to do, we need a change of heart. We need a change in our vision. Peter didn't want to share the gospel with unclean Gentiles. God tells him. He prepares him. He says, don't you call common what I've made clean. It's a radical change in his mindset. See, there was such a wall between the Jew and the Gentile, such a separation, that the only way that it could ever be removed was through the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, the Bible tells us this in Ephesians 2.14, He Himself, Jesus, is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. Do you have a problem with certain people? You have a problem with a certain race. People that work at a certain kind of job. You have a problem with people that sin differently than you do. It's a thing because I'm telling you there's not one of us there's not one of us that's righteous apart from the blood of Jesus. That's the only way our righteousness is filthy rags. But it's amazing how often Christians want to stand in judgment and ridicule, and accusation, and condemnation of people that, could, that sin differently than they do. Oh my. You see, God wants to do a work in some of our hearts this morning and prepare us to reach those very people. He wants to do something in us where we've had some attitudes and some stereotypes maybe that are keeping us back and, and cause us to be the very one to reach those people. Amen. Yes, He can do that. Right. He can change your heart. He can give you a different vision. But we need to realize that whoever they are, whatever they've done, the blood of Jesus is enough. And we'll never win anybody by pointing the finger at them and telling them you're bad and everything you do is wrong. And I'm telling you the way we win people is by sharing Jesus with them and showing them the love of God. That's the only way. You're never going to win people by pointing the finger at them and condemning them. No, we win people by sharing the gospel with them and loving them. It's amazing when you look at the Lord Jesus, you see these things so clearly. He chose a tax collector to be one of the 12. Now, to us, that doesn't really seem like a big deal, but in that culture, a tax collector was considered to be a traitor. He was a thief. He was the lowest of the low. They included tax collectors in the same sentence with prostitutes. And Jesus chose Matthew. Well, we read his gospel part of it this morning in Matthew 28. It's where we took our vision from, Matthew. And how about that other tax collector, Zacchaeus, that little guy that climbs up in a tree because he wanted to see Jesus, and Jesus comes along, and here this guy is. He is known for being a little thief. And Jesus says, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm coming over to your house today. Don't you know people talk? Now, it's okay to make people talk if you're giving them something, the right thing to talk about. You know what I'm saying? Yes. 
Jesus goes to his house and salvation came to his home. He was never the same. That's what we want to see, changed lives. And you see this in Jesus as he loved people and he reached out to people from every kind of walk of life. How about that Mary Magdalene? The Bible says that she was delivered from seven demons. Wow. And then she followed Jesus. Or that woman caught in adultery. Jesus got rid of her accusers and he said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Think about the rest of the twelve. Well, we all know one of them was a traitor. (laughs) But how about those uneducated, smelly fishermen. We need to understand that God wants us to reach every people group. It doesn't matter if they're blue collar or white collar or if they're redneck or I'm just telling you, whoever they are, God wants to reach them. And we need to get rid of those walls, anything that keeps us from reaching out to people. In fact, I'm going to say it again. Some of you who've had an attitude towards certain people and groups, God wants to change you and use you to be the one to go get them and love them into the kingdom of God. Jesus told the religious leaders in Matthew 21, 31, and 32, He says, I tell you the truth, the tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. See, here's the thing. Some of of the ones that you think are are the worst and the the hardest to reach, you're wrong. They're the easiest to reach because they they know they really need something. There's there's something on the inside of them. They know that they need God. See, sometimes it's those old religious people that are hard to reach. Jesus told them straight up, He said, there's... Tax collectors and prostitutes enter into the kingdom ahead of you. That's what he said to religious people. And I'm not saying that we don't want to reach religious people, but I'm saying that a lot of the time, those that we think we ought to just bypass are the very ones that are part of that great harvest that God wants us to reach. And we need to be willing to change the way we think so we can reach people. We want to reach those that don't go to church. I'm not interested in in ever trying to get somebody from another church. Now, you know what? If somebody's been out of church and they show up here, oh man, we're so glad they're here. And I, I want to say this very plainly. You know what? We need to be inviting people. We need to win people out in in this world around us. But when God brings somebody to our church, we need to be ready to receive them and welcome them and love them and connect with them and befriend them. And there's a difference between being friendly, you know, hi, how are you? And actually becoming friends with somebody. Oh, we need that in this church, and I've seen it happen, but I just want to encourage you. I want to say, go get them. Just keep going. Let's keep doing what God has put in our heart to do. There's always going to be distractions. There's always going to be problems. Always going to be opposition. Reminds me of when God put it in the heart of the man, Nehemiah, to go and to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. You need to understand that that was important because as long as the walls of that city were broken down, the people were always going to be in constant distress and constant trouble. But God put it in his heart to rebuild those walls. And he goes there to, to accomplish that task. And Nehemiah was a great leader, but guess what? It took all of the people. Right. Nehemiah couldn't even begin to do it on his own. All of the people came together and they took responsibility. They each had a part in it. And that's the way it is with the vision that the Lord has given His people. All of us are important in the kingdom. All of us have a place in the body of Christ. All of us. You don't think you're not important. See, that's a lie of the devil to convince you that you don't matter. And what you're supposed to do then doesn't get done. For Nehemiah, that would have meant that a certain piece of the wall didn't get finished. 
And we need to understand that in, each of us has a place in what God is doing. Now, as Nehemiah is building the wall, he had lots of opposition and there were distractions. And so it will be in our lives. If we're going to do anything for God, there's always going to be things that happen to distract us, to pull us away or try to pull us away. Nehemiah had people who were saying, come down here, we want to talk to you. Come down, we want to talk to you. And here's what happened. It's Nehemiah 6, 3, and 4. Nehemiah sent messengers to them saying, I'm doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? But they sent me this message four times and I answered them in the same manner. Four times they tried to get him to change his mind. And I want to tell you, if you're doing anything for God... The devil is always going to try to distract you. He'll just keep coming and keep coming and keep coming. You need to realize there's going to be things that happen in your personal life to try to pull you away. But the most important thing in your life is what matters for eternity. The most important thing. See, I'm doing a great work. Let me tell you something. If you become convinced that you're doing a great great work, you won't let anything stop you. But as long as you think it's no big deal, see, as long as you don't have vision, it's easy to just let it go. But when you see that you are a part of what God is doing in the earth in building his church and changing lives for eternity, you're doing a great work. I can't come down. I can't do that. I don't have time for that. I'm doing a great work. Problems and distractions. Of all kinds come, but you stay focused because you're doing a great work. That's the way it has to be. And I want to tell you the one thing that's absolutely necessary, that we got to be willing to keep reaching out to people, letting God use us. I tell you, over the last 40 years of ministry, I've seen it again and again where when people just pray a prayer and that's the end of it they don't become true followers of Jesus they need to be connected in the body of Christ they need brothers and sisters in the Lord to disciple them and show them what it means to really live for God show them how to get free sometimes I'm just telling you it takes more than just one a person praying a prayer by themselves and that's the end of it that's a beginning place but oh how we need the body of Christ to minister to those people and see them become disciples of Jesus that's a changed life see when people get rid of their old destructive habits when they start praying and reading their bible and they're truly following Jesus and serving God that's a changed life And that's why those personal relationships are so important because of the impact we have on other people's lives. I want to close with this. We talked about how things were in Habakkuk's day and how God talked to him. His answer was vision. But then in the third chapter, I want you to see what Habakkuk says in verse 17 and 18. He says, Though the fig tree does not bud and there's no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will be joyful in God my Savior. You see, here he was in the first chapter, he was just complaining He saw how bad everything was. And it's easy for us to fall into that mode where we just complain about the way things are. But then he got vision. And he says that even if it hasn't changed, even if there's no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stalls, he says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord I will be joyful in God my Savior. What happened? He has vision. 
He knows that this is not the end, that God is still moving, God is still working, and He's rejoicing in the vision that He has of the future. And I want to tell you, that's what vision will do, is that even when you're in the thick of the battle, it will give you a victory in your heart that you'll still praise God, no matter how it looks. That's what we need, church. And I want to encourage you today to have a faith attitude, no matter what it looks like, no matter what difficulties come, to keep that vision, keep believing God and expecting God, and not just for the church, but for our own personal life. You know, God gave Joseph a dream. He gave Peter this vision in a trance one day. And so often, He speaks to us and gives us vision about our own personal life through His Word, by the Holy Spirit. But however it comes, I want you to know that that vision will put you on a path to overcome and see victory in your life. Every single one of you is important in what God is doing in the earth today. There's not one of you that doesn't matter. Oh, that's a lie from the enemy. But we got to be on board. We got to be passionate. We got to make up our mind like the Apostle Paul. I'm going to press on to fulfill that call, to fulfill the vision that God has for me personally. Stand with me. We're going to pray. I'd like for prayer partners to come.